Hello. First of all, uh, thank you, Acer, for inviting me back. I did give this talk last year, and I was still invited back, so either I did a good job and more people wanted to hear it, or I did a bad job and this is sort of a redo or a do-over for me. Um, either way, uh, I'm going to, you know, hope that I did a good job the first time. But uh, So uh, no disclosures other than I just want to give a quick plug. I work for the SPR Emergency Imaging and Trauma Committee as well, so if any of you do, do or are members of SPR just and are interested in the committee, just look out for us, but no financial disclosures to talk about. Uh, pediatric thoracic trauma, uh, why is this an important topic? Well, trauma for the pediatric patient is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in patients over the one, one year of age. Uh, most of these come in as motor vehicle collisions, uh, automobiles versus pedestrians, falls, or otherwise intentional. Uh, most of the trauma that we see in the thorax for these patients is from blunt force injury. Uh, in 2015, uh, the data showed there were roughly 140,000 cases, 12% of those, or, or close to 13% of those uh, trauma cases were secondary to thoracic trauma, and approximately 1% of those uh, resulted in fatality. Now, isolated thoracic trauma in its, of itself really only comes for a small portion of these trauma admissions, 5 to 12%, depending on where you look. But when combined with neuronal or abdominal trauma, the mortality rate and morbidity rate significantly increases. Uh, however, even with thoracic trauma, uh, most often fatality is secondary to CNS injury rather than uh, thoracic trauma itself. Uh, so CNS followed by hemorrhagic shock in these patients. Uh, why, is, uh, why does this deserve a talk for itself? Well, child physiology is different than the adults. Uh, we see this in every body part that we image. Neuronal, we'll see it in intracranial injury patterns and C-spine patterns. We know that the C-spine injuries that younger patients uh, have differ significantly from the older population. Musculoskeletal injuries, for example, assault or classifications, uh, chest and abdomen, uh, smaller vessels, the enhanced vasoconstriction, so, such that for visceral injuries in the abdomen, most of these are handled non-operatively now for pediatric patients. The one through four hemorrhages or lacerations of uh, uh, hepatic and splenic injuries, little of these go to surgery anymore. Um, and then lastly, the elasticity of the thorax in the pediatric patients is very important because it pertains to the injury pattern that we see in these patients. Uh, for thoracic imaging and trauma, these blunt force injuries, x-ray is going to be our primary source of imaging. We moved away from the PAN scan a long time ago. Uh, results of numerous studies, um, most frequent I think are uh, back in well, multiple studies, um, some, of the, some of those quoted in 2013. Uh, showed that uh, CT didn't really change much management, but just added significant dose to our, our most uh, sensitive patient population. Um, uh, Golden et al. in 2016 uh, reserved CT imaging for those uh, pediatric patients that had an abnormal mediastinum or mediastinal widening, which would lead to a decrease in CT imaging of approximately 80 percent. If you look at the ACR appropriateness criteria, blunt chest trauma itself for the adults, high energy, X-ray and CT are used complementary, and that's usually appropriate given that nine score. For a normal chest X-ray and not high energy, it, CT or CTA may be appropriate, but again, this is adult data. There's no PEED-specific criteria on the ACR appropriateness criteria. And then if you go through the AST scores, um, again, this is all adult data that they use. Um, I looked at this specifically at Cincinnati when I was there before. For our pediatric trauma service, these initial CTs, when our patients initially presented to the ED department over the uh, past five years or so, uh, total number of trauma patients was about 3,500. Head CTs accounted for about 43% of the initial CTs, body 30%, and chest only 3%. Uh, to look further just at a year's data, um, I'll point this out to you. Um, number of CT tests performed, uh, 650 total that 3.1%, um, just done at Cincinnati itself was 1.4%. The goal was getting the CT down to 1% for our peds trauma patients. Uh, as I was leaving and transitioning to Wake Forest, this was achieved um, at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We're at one, they were at 1% when I left for the, the um, rate of imaging of the thorax in, in our blunt trauma setting. I tried to get this data from Brenner Children's, and as you can see, uh, it wasn't as clean. Uh, my trauma service is working with me on this uh, to, to extrapolate this data, but just pulling it from the system, it took me two months for them to even just give me a list of the, of the CT and their trauma service. Uh, and it, it's just a mess right now. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, it's something that I'm working with with our colleagues. That being said, you can see even with all this, uh, all the imaging, 
over the past year, the chest is still around three to four percent at Wake Forest. Uh, so we're working on it. Um, when I looked at some recent journal articles, Golden et al. and Stevens et al. are two that I would reference uh, for reading. Um, these journals, journal articles really highlight the, the need for x-ray imaging only. Um, our friends out of Portland um, looked at the mechanism of injury and radiographs and used those to predict the need for CT imaging. Of their 6,861 patients, only about 3,000 had chest imaging at time of presentation. Uh, 1,400 or so initially received an x-ray. Of those, 9% were positive. CT only, um, 930, 25% um, of those were positive. And when I say positive, it's positive for contusions, pneumothorax, rib fracture, broken you know, collarbone, anything was a positive. Um, but when you look at, say, the need for imaging or further workup or um, change in management, the, really, the change in management from x-ray to CT didn't really, there was really no correlate between there. And those, the injury severity score were similar for the x-ray and CT only patients. The patients that had CT and x-ray together, uh, about 560 patients or so, of these majority were concordant where the x-ray findings and the CT findings were concordant and there was no change in management. The CT didn't add anything, just radiation. Whatever they were planning to do prior to the CT, they were gonna do it anyway based on the x-ray findings. Uh, 181 of these were discordant, um, where 164 of these disc discordancies resulted in no change in management, but it did add to this, say, injury severity score because there was a contusion or a laceration or occult pneumothorax that you couldn't see on the x-ray. Only 17 of these resulted in change in management. Two resulted in echo, which were negative secondary to sternal fractures. Nine were chest tubes placed for pneumothoraces that were occult. Two esophagrams for pneumomediastinum, which were negative. Uh, two ORIFs, one patient had a beta blocker for uh, descending thoracic aortic injury, and one actually did have a stent placed for a um, type, type A dissection. So let's look at a couple of these um, places or anatomic compartments in, in children. Pneumothoraces, you guys see this very often, 15 to 40% of trauma, depending on where you get your data. Um, there's gonna be those that are always gonna be called, you're never gonna see them on x-ray. You see them on CT, and what happens? Well, the surgeon gets a follow-up chest x-ray two hours later or 24 hours later, and you still say, I still don't see the pneumothorax. It's a call. You know, why are we getting follow-up? Um, but we see a lot, uh, a lot greater than pneumothoraces in children. Um, hemothorax, not very often. Um, in adults, they tend to evacuate all the blood because it can lead to fibrosis or infection. In, in children, we tend to leave some of it, and, and we don't evacuate or don't opt for surgery in those cases. Uh, contusions, these are the most common injuries that you're gonna see in a pediatric patient because the, the elasticity of the chest wall, a lot of that force from the blunt injury is just gonna be transmitted into the lung parenchyma itself. And that's gonna be that airspace disease or that alveolar hemorrhage where you get that ground glass sort of opacification of the lungs. Lacerations, again, more common in pediatric patients because of that uh, transmission of force into the lung parenchyma itself. And this is, you know, just a classic example of what you're gonna see in our patients where you get these areas of ground glass contusions and little lacerations with resultant pneumatoceles and little hemorrhage layering within the pneumatoceles. Airway injuries, uh, my colleague, uh, two, two lectures prior to this one, just covered it very well, so thank you for doing my job for me. Um, most often, this is because of Macklin effect more often than tracheobronchial injuries in pediatric patients. Again, allowing for the mobility of the mediastinum. These are rare. Um, and if they do happen, a lot of times these are fatal before coming to the emergency department. Um, the esophagus, again, my colleague went over this very well. Uh, we don't see these very often in the setting of blunt injury. Um, we used to do esophagrams for these, but that practice went away a long time ago because more often than not, it's Macklin effect, and these kids don't want to swallow the contrast that you're going to give them. They're going to vomit it on you. Um, so I will say, if you do see one, please send it to me, and we can write it up together. Um, Regarding the thorax, the mediastinum, and great vessels, a lot of the aortic injuries that we see are typically fatal before the exam, um, allowing, but allowing for the mobile mediastinum in children, uh, we see a lot less of these great vessel injuries relative to the adults. Um, when you are scrutinizing your radiographs, look for that blurred AP window, the tracheal deviation, the wide and vertebral stripes, the 
uh, or the paratracheal stripes, the, you know, the left apical pleural cap, that is when you want to get ACT. Please image that patient. Um, please image that pediatric patient because those are the patients that we are worried about. There's something going on there. Regarding heart or mediastinal, um, again, already spoken to, but a lot of the contusions, pericardial tears or valve injuries are very oftentimes fatal. Uh, this is just a nice case of a pneumopericardium. This was not a trauma, but it was just highlighted so well. Um, this was one of our bacterial patients. You can see a vertebral body abnormality, and he had an esophageal attresia, and this was, um, this was a traumatic uh, intubation following uh, esophageal um, atresia repair surgery. Um, just tube didn't go appropriately where they wanted it to go, but... Uh, just, just recapping vectoral, you know, for two, anyway. Uh, spinal injuries, uh, these result in axial loading a lot of times. Radiographs are, can be insensitive for a lot of the smaller compression fractures. And subtle fractures, you guys know as well as I do that radiographs are insensitive. You're gonna see those on CT. Um, but significant fractures are often identified and progressive imaging is needed. This patient was sent to us because the radiologist did note the widened mediastinum and said we should image this kit, but you know, again, edge of film, this was missed initially, um, and it was a C67 distraction injury, which led to the hematoma that extended into the mediastinum. So kudos for getting this, um, but you know, this was a traumatic injury. Um, the patient ultimately passed away. Um, these next couple slides are with permission of one of my colleagues on the uh, SPR committee. Uh, he looked, uh, last year somebody asked me questions about, well, aren't you worried about, uh, you know, missing thoracic spinal injuries? And, Yes, uh, we are, uh, but a lot of times uh, pain or patient presentation or exam findings sort of lead you to progressive imaging. So he looked at this specifically, and for 16 years or older, again, CT is usually appropriate. Uh, radiography, again, may be appropriate, but that's for the older patients. Um, for um, you know, MRI, usually appropriate as well. But there's really no national guidelines for the pediatric imaging uh, of the spine following trauma. Um, it's interesting to say that CT of the thoracic lumbar spine may be appropriate. There's a disagreement, though, or MRI disagreement versus, you know, radiography is usually appropriate. Well, he looked at all his trauma patients and did a study, and I'll just breeze through this real quick. Um, he found that in his trauma uh, selection, or in the patients that he studied, most of his fractures were compression-type fractures of the mid-thoracic spine, um, which, again, goes along with the data. He had about 3% fracture rate, um, which is a little bit higher than what the uh, literature reported, but he did note that this is highlighted. No surgically managed fractures were missed on radiographs. Uh, so it's interesting to note that, yes, we are insensitive, but the ones that are significant, we are catching. Uh, diaphragmatic injuries, uh, these result in e imaging, if there's a high clinical suspicion, uh, more often than not, this is because of, of abdominal blunt trauma rather than thoracic blunt trauma because that abdominal force gets transmitted into the chest, uh, left greater than right. Uh, this is not because of the pneumothorax, but it was because the, there was a subtle injury. And this actually was a penetrating trauma. This child got stabbed right at the level of the diaphragm. Um, it was just a nice case that we saw within the past three weeks where there was a subtle a diaphragmatic injury. Um, really, eh, it doesn't project well. Um, but it was a subtle diaphragmatic injury. This kid ultimately had to have a repair. But this is more often what you see in the setting of trauma, where you get you know, a large defect and herniation of bowel loops, herniation of spleen. Uh, this can be a problem because there can be result in vascular compromise, so these need to be reduced and, and repaired surgically. Uh, it's just uh, before any vascular compromise occurs. Uh, the chest wall. Uh, rib fractures, lower rates than adults because of the malleability of the chest. They're not, you know, they have a lot more cartilage. Uh, sternal, clavicle, scapular fractures, soft tissue lacerations, all, all common, um, but less, less so than adults. Um, I think we're getting, uh, um, so ultrasound and MRI, just a quick plug. Uh, these are emerging roles. We're looking at these in the, in the emergent setting, and I think there's a talk following mine on this. Um, you know, the secondary survey uh, you know, persistent pneumothoraces, contusions that do not clear, you know, complicated lacerations, nematocele, spinal tenderness, you know, in those patients, it may not be the initial survey, but the subsequent survey, when you're going back and reassessing these patients, then you might need to pull the trigger on a CT scan if they're having persistent worrying symptoms or decompensation. Take home points, there really is no official guideline for this. Chest X-ray is the best screening tool that we have, and I would ask that, uh, you know, to to decrease dose, use that as your, as your screening tool, get away from the pan scan, 
um, CT can add diagnostic information, but a lot of times it doesn't, uh, doesn't change management on our youngest patients. Thank you.